Welcome to FOS. We are a community creating space for each person to find hope, beauty, and possibility in the story of Jesus. In light of that, we're entering into our new series on questions of Jesus, where we're opening up today with an age-old question of, who is my neighbor? We'll be camping in this story of the Good Samaritan to where it says that a lawyer, which would be a subcategory of the scribes, stands up to challenge and test Jesus. It said that he felt like he had this need, this drive to justify himself. And this is a thing that you'll find. Whenever you're from the assumed center, when you're from the people who are supposed to be running, supposed to be having answers, you'll want to justify your actions because his question had some assumed boundaries and people in mind. And then, mind you, in Luke, throughout the narrative, lawyers were seen as those who delimit social responsibility by being a defender of the old social order of the good and the bad, the moral, the in and the out, as it says that they rejected the baptism of John. And then Luke has it saying that they asked questions of Jesus, like, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Then in this one, who is my neighbor? So lawyers in this time were subset of the scribes, so they weren't like our judicial systems, per se. They were the keepers of the religious tradition, the one that was the social contract obligations, who said who was in and out. They were trained in categorization. So simply put, the lawyer's question of who is my neighbor is a call towards decency and centering the right people. So when he stepped up to check Jesus to test his way of saying, he said, are you keeping the right people center? See, he wants clear and easy lines of authority and orthodoxy, which keep him from being responsible for those outside the lines. He is a champion of law and order. So if you are familiar with the story, then you know that his challenge is the setup for the Good Samaritan. And for the lawyer in his world of the ins and out, the clean lines, the Samaritan would represent an unholy alliance of the, ethic, the ethnically impure and the religiously corrupt. To put a fine point on it, when Jerusalem finally got its freedom from Greece with the Maccabean Revolt, it had liberation for a moment and the right to self-name. It immediately declared war on Samaria, burning down their temple, because even though they adhered to the five books of Moses, they saw them as morally, religiously, and ethnically corrupt. They were a sign of the remnant of the exile. They were the ones that reminded them of corruption. They were not us. So when Jesus brings this up, we want to remember, this is a moral question. This is a long historical fighting question. This isn't just a, well, let's throw out a hypothetical that may or may not have some weight. He said, think of the immoral, the heretical, and the wrong thinking. Think of the one that you would say would corrupt your community by being present. So jumping back, the lawyer's question would echo with those voices today still trying to ask, who is my neighbor? Every time you hear America first or build a wall, we're being enthralled by the lawyer's question, following his logic of delimiting social responsibility by defining who is our neighbor. When Iowa, which recently passed a proposal to ban gay marriage, removing protection from a marginalized community, is trying to define laws and boundaries of people for uh, protection, they are still trapped in the lawyer's logic of who is my neighbor. It reminds me of my friend here who j just had their second pride flag stolen. Now in a neighborhood that has a flag on almost every house, the people went by all the American and the military flags hanging everywhere and chose to violate and to vandalize the one representing a marginalized community, the LGBTQ. They showed grace though, rather than pressing charges because the ring camera actually caught who did it even their license plate when they pulled in front of the house to go steal things. They sat them down and said, why would you want to make our time in this neighborhood harder than it needs to be? We are your neighbors and we struggle enough with people trying to control us. It actually worked for a positive end for the kid who, who saw in that meeting a whole family, not just a symbol and a flag, 
saw a whole life which led him to a compassionate response. And it's important to note right now that every person I have mentioned, every vile act of America first, even the compassionate response from uh, my friends, all claim to be part of the Christian tradition. We have spent so many centuries answering the lawyer's question while convincing ourselves that we're really dealing with Jesus. And in doing so, the call of the neighbor has shrunk so that they become silos of people like us. And it's shrunk to the point of just being a how-to guide for being nice to people who are cruel. And honestly, how many more talks do we need describing how to smile at abusive people rather than change systems? How long do we need to tame the answer to the story so that the lawyer would never be offended, would never be put off by the way that we live it out. In fact, most of our answers follow his logic. Our predictable reading of the Good Samaritan parable secures our superiority because it keeps us as the center of the structure of power. To change nothing, just be a little extra nice to the undeserving, immoral, and heretical other. And maybe, in the end, we'll even convert them so that they will erase their otherness and just make them like us. And we'll rest comfortably knowing that we have it right and have nothing more to learn. We just simply need to endure in our greatness until the end. So as we step into Luke 10, remember that the good and moral people are represented in the lawyer. The Samaritans are seen as immoral and corrupt by people like the lawyer. For the lawyer in Jerusalem, the Samaritan would represent the margins, not the center, the corruption, not the pure. Jesus doesn't define the neighbor, that's the lawyer. Jesus challenges the lawyer to see path towards inheriting life as a tall towards transgressing boundaries and empathetic and sympathetic response. The center needed the margins to teach them how to become a neighbor. Now, if we're involved in race and queer conversations right now, it'd be framed this way, that Jesus's transgressive question is who is willing to become an ally. And the one who's willing to risk to become an ally is learning from the margins how to be a neighbor. Now then, if you do not see yourselves as centered, if you're not needing to learn from the margins, then for those of us who, like myself, are cisgendered white male in North America, I need your voice because you're the one I need to learn from on what it means to neighbor. Now going through the passage of Luke 10, 27 to 37, it says that the scribes stood up, or sorry, the lawyer stood up to challenge Jesus. He goes through the predictable when it goes through the answer of, you know, love the Lord your God, yep. love your neighbor as yourself. But then when Jesus brushes him off, says, good, you know, go do it. It says that he seeks to self-justify. Because for those of us who are trying to go back to traditional boundaries, often what happens when we, you get shown that your rhetoric is a bit hollow, you self-justify with tradition and history. And so what is the age-old fight that they've had that's defined a lot of the biblical tradition as saying, how far do my social obligations go? It says, but who is my neighbor? And then Jesus steps into a story where some patriotic freedom fighters called Liste who are most likely within the Lucan narrative trying to fight to liberate Jerusalem from Rome, come upon a man, leaving him for dead. The priest and the Levite come on him too, also mirroring the patriotic revolutionaries leave him for dead. But then the immoral Samaritan comes and says that the big distinction is the Samaritan is moved by compassion. So the Samaritan then takes the good person leaving Jerusalem deeper into corrupt space, deeper into Gentile territory. And we know this because it says it was by happenstance that while the Samaritan was traveling, sees him and then takes him towards an inn, which is a Gentile thing, not a Jewish thing. Then de demonstrates excessive faithfulness by teaching the Gentile innkeeper how to take covenant. When he says, take care of him and whatever excess that you have, when I come back, I'll pay for it. And it uses the same verb of taking care of that it said he used when he saw his trauma on the side of the road. So he says, emulate my response towards the good man in the ditch. Take care of him like I have, and I will take care of the rest. 
Then Jesus turns to the lawyer and says, so who became a neighbor? Now notice that switch. The lawyer said, who is my neighbor? Making it a category that we can define and delineate, we can separate from. Jesus said, well, let's push a little bit farther. Who became a neighbor? And so it's not a fixed state, much like allyship. You're an ally as long as you commit yourself to the task of allying with the margins. And it struck the lawyer so profoundly that the lawyer was upset. He couldn't even say the Samaritan, which would be the easy answer. He s circumvented that uh, naming to said, well, the one who practiced mercy. See, the lawyer said Jerusalem first. Jesus responded with Samaritan lives matter. And this is set in the framework of inheriting life, which is a way of talking about what it means to honor the covenant. So the immoral, unholy, ethnically wrong and mixed Samaritan upheld covenant by becoming moved were the moral, the good, and the right keepers of covenant, the patriotic revolutionaries, the priests and the Levites, had room in their rightness to step over a body. Jesus demonstrated something revolutionary, orthopraxy over orthodoxy, compassionate, empathetic response over moralism, mercy over right faith, or as often was qu um, quoted within the first century of Christianity from Hosea, they echoed out that God desires mercy, not sacrifices. Empathetic response, not correct ritual thinking. So Jesus is pulling a strand of his own Jewish tradition saying, there's a thread here that unites and takes us forward, past Jerusalem, past boundaries, past neighbors as category into a neighbor's state of being. And in Jesus' challenge of who becomes as opposed to who is, the lawyer who is socially centered is asked to identify as the one in need, the one left in the ditch lacking, who must be taught how to become a neighbor, an ally, by the margins themselves. So Jesus' question assumes that far from having something to give, the lawyer first and foremost needed to own his own lack of understanding, had to be taught how to show up by the margins, and then after being taught by the Samaritan what faithfulness looks like, Jesus says, go and become a neighbor. Let go of your preoccupation with limits and right faith to become an ally. This act of letting go to embrace the compassionate response will lead to inheriting life and becoming a neighbor. And then it forever leaves the notion of neighbor fluid and open. It leaves us to sit in and to embrace the compassionate response to the others that we see in need. Because as we've learned to be loved and to receive from the people we thought we could not, as we learn that act of allyship and neighboring, we then, in response to that, live it out as we go. But for those of us who are centered, we start from lack. We start from saying, I don't know. I cannot see what I cannot see. And we are taught by the margin. We're taught by the voice of saying, justice hasn't arrived this far. Be our neighbor. And from there, there's hope that in becoming a neighbor tomorrow will be different than yesterday. Mm -hmm.